that your tribe is complaining about you and claiming that you are reviling their gods and saying this, that, and the other. Allah's apostle said, Uncle, I want them to utter one saying. There is no Allah but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. If they say it, the Arabs will submit to them, and the non-Arabs will pay the jizya tax. The jizya is an exorbitant tax collected by Muslims from Christians and Jews to this very day. It's called the protection tax, and it works just like the one imposed by the mafia. If you pay it, they let you live. If you don't, they kill you. Just in case you think this hadith is too incriminating to be part of Islamic lore, too money-grubbing to be prophetic, consider these words from Islam's God. After telling Muslims that, Allah will enrich you out of his bounty, Quran 9.29 says, Fight those people of the book, that would be Christians and Jews, who do not follow what Allah and his messenger, Muhammad, acknowledge as the true religion, Islam nor accept our law until they pay the jizya tax in submission and feel themselves subdued, being brought low. A second translation reads, Pay the tax in acknowledgment of our superiority and their state of subjection. Islam was a money-making scheme, a profitable profit plan. Quran 108 verse 3 For he who insults you, Muhammad, will be cut off. Compare these words with those of Christ. Unjustly rather than justifiably criticized. Physically tortured rather than verbally teased. Christ prayed, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. But the dark spirit of Islam cuts the insulters down, sending them off to burn in hell. At this point, it's anyone's guess as to what surah came next. The 75th is as likely as any. The self-reproaching spirit says, Quran 75, verse 1, I swear by the day of resurrection, and I call to witness the self-reproaching spirit, the accusing soul. Does man think that we cannot assemble his bones? The accusing soul is Satan, although it could be Muhammad, for he incriminates himself with every word. As for assembling bones, Islam preaches bodily resurrection, not spiritual salvation. The drunken orgy in the Garden of Bliss requires a body, not a soul, heart, or brain. As the surah continues, we learn that the day of resurrection and doom are one and the same. We are also confronted with the darkening of the moon, an overt satanic reference. Verse 3. Nay, we are able to put together the tips of his fingers, but man wishes to do wrong and feign denial. He questions, when is the day of doom? So when the sight becomes dazed and the moon becomes dark, and the sun and the moon are brought together, man will say, where is the refuge? By no means, there will be no place of safety. Nay, man will be evidence against himself, though he tenders his excuses. Move not your tongue concerning the Quran to make haste. <laughs> Don't you just love the transition? It is for us to collect it, put it together, and promulgate it. When we have read it, follow its recital as promulgated. It is for us to explain it. Muslim critics claim that the point of friction between Muhammad and his tribe was over resurrection. But that's not true. As evidence that Arabs believed in an afterlife, they had their relatives tie their favorite camel to their grave so they would follow them to paradise. Heaven might be big, and there was no sense of walking when one could ride. Thus, a belief in an afterlife wasn't the point of contention. The real problem was that Muhammad said his people's ancestors were burning in hell because they died during the period of ignorance, pre-Islam, in that the Meccans loved their parents and grandparents, this upset them and naturally caused many to assail Muhammad's parochial and intolerant view. They may also have chafed at his lewd depictions of heaven and his sadistic portrayal of hell. The moon becoming dark and being brought together with the sun is troublesome. In the Bible, the moon is the illusory, false, and counterfeit source of illumination, therefore symbolic with Satan. Darkness is equated with evil and deception. The Bible says men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. The abrupt transition in this surah is like most of the Quran. 
move not your tongue to make haste, comes completely out of the blue. There is no segue or context. It makes no sense. God is eternal. Furthermore, the suggestion that God has to explain his Quran for it to make sense is embarrassing. It brings to mind one of the book's final and most troubling verses. Quran 5, verse 101. Believers ask not questions about those things which, if made plain to you, may cause you trouble when the Quran is revealed. Some people before you asked questions, and on that account lost their faith. Madudi, in his commentary, The Meaning of the Quran, explains, The Prophet forbade people to ask questions or to pry into such things. The Hadith confirms this prophetic warning. Bukhari, I heard the Prophet say, Allah has hated you for asking too many questions. The reason questions are prohibited is that there is no cogent explanation for Islam. It epitomizes and relies upon ignorance. The deeper one digs, the more obvious the deception becomes. And this is precisely why Muslims protect their doctrine by attacking those who quote from their scriptures. They know the surest way to save Muslims from Islam is to expose them to it. The Resurrection, Surah continues, Quran 75, verse 20, But men love the present life, and neglect the hereafter. Some faces that day will beam, looking toward their Lord, and some faces will be gloomy, knowing that some great back-breaking calamity is about to be inflicted upon them. Yes, when their soul comes up to their throat and reaches their collarbone, they will cry, Is there a magician or wizard who can save us? But they will know that it is the hour of parting, and one leg will be joined to another. Agony heaped on agony, affliction combined with affliction. It's hard to imagine how a religion this full of satanic overtones and this fixated on anguish has survived, much less grown. If it weren't for the sword, Islam would have been stillborn. Yes, I know that the Bible also speaks of hell and punishment. So why attack Islam so vehemently? The answer is appropriateness, proportion, personal involvement, and vividness. First, the Bible speaks of hell as a place for those who have received ample and rational divine revelation, but have chosen to reject it. It provides standards for living via scripture an advance of judgment. The Bible even provides real proof that its revelations are godly through countless miracles and predictive prophecies. Those who end up in hell have to ignore all of this and choose not to be with God. Further, the biblical hell wasn't created for man. It was designed for Halal bin Shakar, known as Lucifer, and his fallen angels, today's demons, as a result of their disobedience. It's little wonder Islam's dark spirit spends so much time there. The Quran never proves its divine authority, and is yet to provide either ample revelation or standards for living. And there is no example to follow. Muhammad was the lone prophet, and his life was the antithesis of godly. In other words, it's inappropriate for God to threaten hell before he has explained what people must do to avoid it. Second, the frequency of the Quran's references to hell and its tortures are alarmingly out of proportion. I have not taken the passages describing retribution out of context. Every early surah has been presented in its entirety. Bad overwhelms good in the Quran. Hell is featured, not heaven. Rebuffing Muhammad's tormentors is far more prevalent than instructing the faithful. Torment is the Quran's most prominent theme. Third, Hell in the Bible is separation from God. In the Quran, Allah is the driving force of hell, its creator and manager. Allah wants to be left alone with man so that he can oversee his tortures. This is a fundamental difference between Yahweh and Allah, between Judeo-Christianity and Islam. In the Bible, the reward of heaven is being with God. In the Quran, by contrast, the reward is being with virgins. Communion with Allah isn't mentioned. Fourth, the Bible's depictions of hell are many magnitudes milder. The vividness in which Allah describes the specifics of hell's torments is deeply disturbing, even demented. Fifth, in Judeo-Christianity, hell is a place one chooses. No one is sent there against their will. We are all given a choice. Love God and form a personal relationship with Him. Ignore Him and have death be final. Or oppose Him 
and spend eternity separated from him.